folks, and welcome to this session on racial capitalism as part of the conference Post-Capitalism, Building the Solidarity Economy. My name is David Cobb. I am on the leadership team of Cooperation Humboldt and the co-coordinator of the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network, and I'm going to be very transparent. Uh, this session is one of the ones I've been looking forward to the most. This, this conference has been fantastic. Uh, and this one for me is something that I'm looking forward to, not only for the subject matter, but frankly, for the people that we have grappling with this. The subject matter, personally, I don't think it's possible to get to a post-capitalism conference without addressing and ultimately dismantling white supremacy itself. Uh, and the, the people who are presenting, who are in dialogue, uh, are really some of the folks I hold in the highest of regard and esteem, not only as theorists and thinkers, but also as people who are literally doing the work on the ground, uh, actually engaging in, a, uh, in the experiment, as it were. So this is going to be an opportunity to actually get our praxis on, right, with some folks who have deep theory and are, are applying it into practice, lessons learned. The, the, the format will be simple. Uh, we'll hear from each of our presenters for about five to 10 minutes. And then the rest of us basically get the opportunity for a dialogue, uh, a fishbowl, if you will. We're gonna be listening to the four of them in conversation together. I'll occasionally come in with some questions or uh, comments. So if you have any questions or comments, please make good use of the chat. But for the most part, we'll be hearing from our panelists. Our panelists will go in this order for their opening sessions. First, Søren Mudlar, Mudliar, who is the editor of Socialism and Democracy and uh, on the leadership of the Liberty Tree Foundation for the Democratic Revolution. Next, we'll hear from Wendy Marshall, who is an adjunct professor at Temple, but most importantly, at least for this conversation and in my world, she is a leader in People Strike. Uh, which emerged at the beginning of the pandemic with the clarity of not only what was happening, but frankly, what needed to be done. She will be followed by Etheban Kelly, who is with Aorta, a uh, popular education training session on uh, anti-oppression, and also the uh, director, I believe is his title, uh, with the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops, uh, Shout out, Cooperation Humboldt is a member of the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops. Uh, and if you wanna learn how to do co-ops, that's the place to go. And we'll be concluding with Jerome Scott, uh, who is a long distance runner uh, for social justice uh, and a post-capitalist world in this country. Uh, Jerome's uh, bio is uh, incredible, uh, but if you don't know about the Detroit Revolutionary Union Movement, uh, check it out. Uh, because uh, lessons learned there. He also went on to found Project South uh, and was really instrumental in helping to create the U.S. social forum process. Uh, somebody I consider not only uh, a mentor, but a cherished friend. And with that, I'm going to stop talking and turn this over to Surin. Thank you. I should explain to everyone, the reason I'm going first is I got to the conversation last. And so the decision was made for me already. So that's how I get to, as David puts it, get my praxis on first. Uh, I'm going to ask the question, why say racial capitalism in 2021? And I also have to confess that until this moment, I really didn't know how I was going to answer that question, not because I haven't thought about the topic, but because I thought about it too much and engaged in too much practice and find it difficult to bring the two together. Nonetheless, I'm going to answer the question affirmatively that we should say racial capitalism in 2021, and I'm going to provide some reasons for it. Toni Morrison describes a friend of your mind as one who gathers the pieces I am and gives them back to me all in the right order. I'm going to ask if racial capitalism is such a friend of the mind. My answer is not straightforward. I believe that the concept has questionable theoretical foundations, but that it, would, that it was an important political tool against certain practices and a corrective against those who would frame capitalism as, as an abstract system that would eventually deracialize itself. 
if you are to sort of graph out when these terms, when the term racial capitalism was used, you'll find two peaks, one in the 1970s into the early 80s, a drop off, and then around 2012, it picks up again and keeps growing to, to reach about the same level as it did in the early 1980s. So I'd like to go back to what prompted that early shift in the 1970s in order to answer the question. So. The term emerged in South Africa in the mid 1970s. It came from radical thinkers, ones who were deeply connected to the workers' movement, who argued against liberation movement orthodoxy. Uh, the, the orthodoxy they were arguing against was that one first had to liberate South Africa from racial domination before addressing capitalism. By the mid 1980s, these thinkers would be expelled from the African National Congress. And ironically, the trade union movement that they played a huge role in building would essentially discard their theory and, move, and adopt the orthodoxy of the liberation movement. That the next four decades of South African history would offer them some sort of moral vindication is doubtless of little solace to them because this was an opportunity to build socialism in a relatively well-developed country. We could ask how realistic was their reading? And we have to bear in mind that although the 1960s wave of social movement activity was receding in the global north, at that moment, the South was relatively optimistic, so late 70s. The thought that state power could produce socialist oriented states seemed to have foundations in reality. You had the liberation of Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and Angola, not to mention the Grenadian and Nicaraguan revolutions. All of this was happening at the same time. And as a consequence to the question of race persisting beyond capitalism into socialism was also on the agenda. It was in this context that Cedric Robinson, who is seen as the main popularizer of the concept of racial capitalism, was writing and thinking, right? And he was publishing in the same journals as the South African radical thinkers uh, uh, were, were publishing at this in retrospect, euphoric moment in the history of the revolutionary movements, right? Um, as uh, Charisse burden Steli recognizes, however, where the South Africans use the term racial capitalism to particularize and understand their political possibilities, Robinson would also universalize racial capitalism to suggest that racial capitalism is a generalization and a globalization of European feudal era doctrines and thinking. Today, we have the logical outcome of this pattern of thinking about racial capitalism, one in which capitalism disappears from the political narrative or where capitalism exists in the political narrative, it yields to accounts of racism that has little place for capitalism as a system. And, and so, so what we find is that many of those who do use the term racial capitalism, mistake or redefine racial capitalism to the micro foundations in which individuals possess race and it is strategically deployed to maximize their returns. Or where they do address the racial structure, it is seen as a relatively immutable hierarchy, one maintained by a set of attitudes. The best example of this, uh, and it's a leading example given that it's a bestseller, is Isabel Wilkerson's most recent book, Cost, The Origins of Our Discontent. It describes a cost structure that is fixed, cost as a skeleton, under the skin of racism, one that is sometimes covered by the clothes of social class. In a recent interview, she said, if you can fake it, it is class. So this gives you a sense of her hierarchy of um, how these different moments interact with one another, right? Um, the word capitalism itself never appears in the book. It, in fact, it appears once in a footnote where it's citing the title of Edward, the subtitle of Edward Baptiste's magnificent book, The Half Has Never Been Told. And yet she constantly skirts the challenge of capitalism and socialism throughout the huge book. Sometimes she never realizes how close she is to the horizon of capitalism and socialism. In chapter three, for example, she tells the story of Dr. Martin Luther King's visit to India, where um, uh, on a side trip, he was gathered at a meeting hosted for him in Kerala by its chief minister, who introduces him to a school for Dalits for, uh, as a fellow untouchable, an American untouchable. 
What Wilkerson never points out, however, that this school was created by this minister and by the movements there, and that these people were all communists. He, in fact, that chief minister was part of the first wave of communist governments to rule that part of India. And for all their missteps and mistakes with regard to caste, they were the ones who began to problematize along with people in, in, in the um, untouchable communities to challenge the caste structure. And if we are to understand racial capitalism and its many different forms of production and oppression, the ones that it articulates, we have to understand it as much as a movement. Uh, uh, we have to understand it as part of a movement that is challenging it. We have to understand it not only as a structure, but as movements which oppose it. And if we are to do it in that way, we then have to incorporate not merely um, racial capitalism, but anti-racist socialism. And unfortunately, uh, I think that um, Wilkerson uh, simply uh, elides the whole issue. However, I would say that there is that racial capitalism as a tool helps us engage with people like Isabel Wilkerson or, or more recently Charles M. Blow in his book, The Devil You Know. Um, and, and this is because their anti-racism uh, lacks uh, a, an explicit understanding of capitalism and racial capitalism may be the tool that allows us to engage with these liberal thinkers on the question of race. Um, the current focus of much of the left outside of socialist thinkers like Charisse burden Staley, who oppose racial capitalism to anti-racist socialism is to focus on strategic sectors of the working class, identifying those with the most capacity to disrupt the supply chains of capitalism. While admirable and necessary, we must ask, what about the rest of the working class, especially those sectors abandoned or warehoused, as it were, by capitalism? I believe that they have e efficacy, not only in terms of their formal voting powers, which are not inconsiderable when we consider the lengths that the state goes to disenfranchise them, but also within their capacity to organize other forms of production that run contrary to capitalism and form the basis for a political process to challenge capitalism. So why do we need capitalism as a, con uh, as a concept? Because it helps us understand the constitution of a working class subject, which is necessary to transform society and to get beyond capitalism itself. And this points to the political task of not only disrupting capitalism, but the positive task of representing and engaging diverse sections of the working class, including those excluded workers. Uh, as a consequence, I think that political that the use of the term racial capitalism helps us understand some of the political tasks that are presently necessary. Charles Post uh, recently asks or seeks out a unified theory of capitalism and racial oppression and notes the ambitions for racial capitalism uh, or, uh, uh, that some of us have as one that transcends neoliberal identity politics and class reductionism. And he engages with the specifics of well-defined historical periods. As valuable as that exercise is, I believe that our answers and eventual theory are are uh, unlikely to be discovered in theory adjudicated by the laboratory of history, but in the art of revolutionary practice developed in the present. The working class as a real movement from dispersed and divided layers and fractions into a subject requires not only our ability to disrupt capital, as I pointed out earlier, but our ability to imagine and reconfigure the whole, understanding the part to be played by race in confronting who is uh, a critical, uh, who is critical to the process. And it is a political task that questions things like leadership development and representation within the political formations we develop to get us out of capitalism and to our, uh, and to our shared humanity. I'll just conclude with a, a quick anecdote. Um, just as COVID was reaching our shores, waiting while waiting outside my apartment in Chelsea, Massachusetts, a minivan pulled up. 
a door slid open, four teens and their moms, and their mom tumbled out of this uh, minivan. All of them had packages in hand. Rapidly, they, they spread out and ran up to different doors. They were delivering Amazon packages. I spoke to her as I let her into the building and she, she was from Honduras and her kids were helping her make the deliveries. She was the only person being paid, not by Amazon, but by a contractor working for Amazon. How does racial capitalism gather together the pieces of her life and hand it back to her in the right order? I don't know, but that is the challenge as we try to understand what organization will organize her and the rest of us into a revolutionary subject. Thank you. Wendy Marshall. Thank you, David. Thank you, Saren. Um, Southern trees bear a strange fruit, blood on the leaves and blood on the root. Black bodies swinging in the southern breeze, strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees. Pastoral scene of the gallant south, the bulging eyes and the twisted mouth. Scent of magnolias sweet and fresh, the sudden smell of burning flesh. Here is a fruit for the crows to pluck, for the rain to gather, for the wind to suck. For the sun to rot, for the tree to drop, here is a strange and bitter crop. The lyrics to Strange Fruit, while specifically about lynching in the post-Civil War U.S. South, also speak to the brutal and bloody origins of capitalism. Blood on the leaves and blood on the root. The modifier racial added to capitalism is unnecessary because racialism was crucial to the engine of capitalism. Capitalism as we know it would not exist without the enslavement of indigenous people under Spanish imperialism, the Atlantic slave trade, and the theft of indigenous lands in the Americas and beyond. In Europe, at the end of the 14th century, English, English peasants possessed lands in common, but by the end of the 15th century, they had been forcibly removed from the land, driven by the profits to be had through wool manufacturing, Land that had been used for subsistence farming was transformed into enclosures for sheep. In the course of the 18th century, in a process that foreshadows later colonial theft of land, laws were written that became the instruments through which the people's land was stolen. Primitive accumulation, the enclosure of, na of nature, meant that the land and the people were no longer engaged in reciprocal processes. Indeed, it meant that the very meaning of humanity, of nature, and of well being was transformed. Once the land was owned, the people followed. And Peter Leinbaugh, the historian, has argued that industrial capitalism in the Atlantic world depended upon the twin pillars of land enclosures and the slave trade. Leinbaugh wrote, together, the expelled commoners and the captured Africans provided the labor power available for exploitations in the factories of the field, in the production of sugar and tobacco, and the factories of the towns, the manufacturers of wool and cotton. Whether Europeans or Africans, the lords of humankind looked upon them indifferently as laboring bodies to produce surplus va value, which entirely depended upon a prior discommoning. While racism and Eurocentric supremacy existed before capitalism, the exploitation of African and indigenous labor was crucial fuel to the growth of capitalism, such that race became a motive and an alibi for plunder. Africans captured and transported across the Atlantic became a basis for the accumulation of wealth, as did the colonial seizure of African lands. This terror, brutality, and dispossession required, as Pete Dolak writes in a recent Counterpunch article, an accompanying ideology. White supremacy became that ideology. If we examine the rise of capitalism in the US, we see blood at the root. Cotton was to the early 19th century what oil was to the 20th century, the commodity that determined the wealth of nations. Cotton amounted to a staggering 50% of US exports and ignited the economic boom that, that catapulted the US into premier status. That's a quote by Garaku Changai. The cotton crop depended upon both enslaved labor, the theft of fertile indigenous lands, and the dispossession of Creek, Seminole, Choctaw, Cherokee, Chickasaw, and others. The seizure of these fertile indigenous lands was the basis for the Indian Removal Act of 1830 in the US and the Trail of Tears, as well as the rise of US capitalism. 
It is clear that the existence of the US as a first world nation and a capitalist hegemon depended upon the degradation of our African and indigenous ancestors. Racial is an unnecessary modifier for capitalism. But while the description of this panel in the conference program describes, describes racial capitalism as the exploitation of non-white people, it's very important to grasp the other moment in the dialectic. White people, white society, and the privileges inherent therein absolutely depend upon the death, degradation, and destruction of Afri African, indigenous, and other colonized people. White privilege and white wealth depend upon racial capitalism. It would be a step forward for us to recognize that for the concept, it would be a step forward for us to recognize that the concept racial capitalism conjure up both the blood at the root of white society, as well as the deep implication of capitalism and white supremacy. Check. Thank you, Wendy. At the Von Kelly. Thanks, David. Um, and good afternoon or morning, depending on where you're you're zooming in from. Um, thanks so much for framing that up, uh, both to to Surin and, and and Wendy. I just want to add a couple things to sort of build on it, and I'm also chewing on this question in real time about racial capitalism, uh, about racial as a modifier, and I think that maybe it's helpful to share this as the framing for our conversation today. I think. The way that the concept was partially rescued from Cedric Robinson and, and amplified and, and given new life for me, um, partially by Robin D.G. Kelly and by Ruth Wilson Gilmore, I had thought of, I had thought of it more as a hyphen, as like a compound word, which, sh which shifts how we receive the concept and the productive work that it does. So maybe take that as a I don't think it's just like a rhetorical thing, but it 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 does inform how I'm how I'm even speaking about racial capitalism, um, which is that you know under capitalism, every anyone everyone under the eyes of the ruling class, anyone outside of the ruling class, it ha has the capacity to be racialized, and I think that's one of the things that's important to keep in mind when we're investigating like what even is the history of capitalism, like what is happening, um, the history, the geography, you know, the spatiality of it, all of those pieces. And, and I do I do bring a, a lot of spatial thinking. Um, some of my background is more on the uh, radical geography kind of side of things, um, which is probably evident from me mentioning uh, Ruth Gilmore as, as one, of, um, one of my instructors around um, the concept of racial capitalism. And so I, I think one of the examples that I return to in helping people understand that as a educator um, is looking at ways that, that even in England um, and eventually the, the UK in, in their project of accumulating wealth through um, primitive accumulation and other forms, uh, er, er, the early history of racial capitalism, they racialized Irish people who nowadays obviously would be considered white. And so even the, the category of whiteness is, is mutable. Um, and, and yet, if when we zoom out to this understanding or this framework of racial capitalism, um, that's less mutable. There's like a category of the rule, like we're talking about the ruling class and the subordination of everyone underneath that. And then there's different kinds of work um, that the process of racialization does, which is to say it has nothing to do with your identity. <laughs> like you wake up and you feel this way or you have certain cultural practices, like capitalism doesn't care um, other than ultimately in late capitalism, the ability to market, to exploit that as something to market toward. <laughs> um, but uh, but that it's it's more around the racialization of something, which is to say, for me, it's less about my being black or my identifying as black, and more about the ways in which our political economy racializes me as black, um, and and people like me as black, um, which has nothing to do with phenotype and 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 my appearance, but it has everything to do with where our incinerators <laughs> located in the in the geography of Philadelphia, where I'm zooming in from. Um, and so I think that that's true about racialization generally, and it helps us understand um, race in and of itself. So not only, I think that when I'm saying that they're hybridized terms, 
capitalism helps us understand racism just as much as racism helps us understand capitalism in this formation of racial capital. Um, and I don't, that, so I don't wanna subsume one of the terms with the, under the other. Um, and I think that that's important as we think about strategies for, um, for fighting this and to, to, to pushing toward that horizon of, of post-capitalism, uh, which is you know, the theme of this conference. Um, and so within that, I think that there's certain stories around um, different indigenous people. Um, uh, some of some of what I want to talk about is looking at Black people um, as a source of wealth, but also as a source underneath racial capitalism, also as as a as a as a repository um, to absorb the various crises of capitalism. Which is to say, oh my God, an unemployment crisis. Well, that becomes a Black problem, <laughs> um, or a surplus of capital let's build up a bunch of prisons and have black bodies be the source of absorbing that black communities that are disrupted through an incarceration pro incarceration problem um or even you know we've just been thinking about this the last couple of days with um with earth day just a few days ago right before this conference kicked off um even the idea of pollution being the the wealth and profit that comes of uh 20th century industrial capitalism um, needing a very immediate um, sort of where does the externalization of waste and runoff and pollution go? Well, there's that's a geography that is then concentrated on Black people. So it's I, I think there's a tremendous amount of solidarity when you tune into the stories from around the world, especially from third world movements in in that same moment in time. And it was helpful um, to listen to Sir and start to um, to invite that into the conversation. Um, that the solidarity is both, oh yeah, y'all in the North are the biggest climate polluters and also remembering this is part of the same logic, the same regime, the same power where we experienced it first, right? Indigenous people experienced it first in, in North America, black people experienced it um, alongside them and, and, out, and throughout the 20th century and, and, and up till today, which is like, oh yeah, we're profiting off of burning coal and fossil fuels in all these ways where and it just so happens that certain bodies need to absorb um, the runoff of that, including the impacts on our, our health um, and, and our families. So it, that also helps us like to connect those dots, that it's part of the, the equation always has to balance, right? That there's profits and it's at the expense of, it comes from um, uh, racialized bodies and, and uh, from the context of the US um, and the global hegemony of our, of our financial markets um, that has everything to do with black Americans. Um, so whether that's redlining, unemployment, um, the housing bubble, uh, that all those toxic mortgages, like those, that was one of the few moments where there was starting to be an emerging black middle class not one that was critical of capitalism, not arguing that. And yet when there was that crisis, when that bubble needed to burst, wh whose wealth was wiped out overnight and, and, and ne never to recuperate, that was black Americans, right? So it helps us understand a lot of things about how capitalism is operating when we're clear of the role of, of labor and surplus and how that maps onto whether the question is housing or land, um, even the stories, right, of, um, uh, of Isabel Wilkerson's earlier book, uh, The Warmth of Other Sons, um, I think there she's actually doing a much more powerful and useful job of illustrating the ways that it's not just that indigenous people were dispossessed through white settler colonialism, but also black people. Like lynching was a way of chasing black people out of the South where we had uh, majorities uh, just demographically in the population, there's currently not a single state in the United States with a majority black population. Um, and that, that only became true through the process of Jim Crow and terrorism that was supported by the state and supported by this compromise of how um, the federal government worked um, and the, the sort of compromise with the Dixiecrats, that that was a project of, of burning down, sabotaging some of the efforts around the social solidarity economy that Black people needed in order to survive, right? And then silencing that that history had ever happened through the cultural project of white supremacy. Uh, oh, we're the only ones who understand cooperation. <laughs> and it's like, y'all, uh, we done been doing this for, for a really long time. Um, so I wanted to invite that piece in too, as we start to pivot toward um, a world 
um, that's premised on on uh, the social solidarity economy and and post capitalism. Um, and lastly, just this question of beyond you know things like poisoning the air or the water, you know, anytime there's a need to a crisis in capitalism, that it is Black people, not heroically, not as subjects, but as objects, who are summoned to come to the rescue. So when we need to defund public schooling, because it is no longer in service of the state under racial capitalism, whose schools are defunded <laughs> first? Right, um, and so we see the impacts of all these things. You know, prisons to absorb surplus labor, unemployment problems, all of those kinds of things. So, uh, mostly wanting to put those on the table while we even talk about uh, the 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 gospel of white supremacy um, and how that kind of connects with these political economic systems. Thank you, Esteban. Jerome Scott. Thank you, David. And uh, first of all, before I even start talking, I, I just want to congratulate the conveners of, of this conference on this panel. You know, uh, sitting here listening to the presentations um, and looking at who's doing the presentation. You know, how many conferences have we been to that were multiracial conferences where all the speakers talking about capitalism? were people of color, you know, and presenting a post-capitalist analysis of capitalism as well. You know, so y'all should be congratulated on that. And, and it also makes me very happy to be on this panel. And I really appreciate the presentations because they were all very good and very historical. I just want to bring up a couple of concepts that, that maybe hadn't been uh, presented yet. First, on this whole concept of racial capitalism, back in the 70s, when um, I worked in the auto plants in Detroit, and this whole concept, we became aware of it, we were very leery of this whole thing of racial capitalism, you know, because here we are workers working in the factory and, you know, trying to figure out, are they trying to say that there's a different uh, situation around capitalism that is racial capitalism? and that if we can get rid of that, then we're okay. Finally, when we started thinking about it, we decided, well, let's look at it from our experience, our understanding of, of what we're living through. And we came up with this whole understanding that really um, the racial content of capitalism really represented super exploitation. You know, because we realized in the plant where we work, black workers were not the only workers getting exploited. So was the white workers and women workers and every other worker in that plant. But, but what distinguished Blacks is that we got the lowest paying, most dangerous jobs in the plant. You know, and we looked at it like, you know, they're, they're super exploiting us. That's what racial capitalism meant to us, a super a, a exploitation on top of the regular exploitation that every worker got. And we really looked at it from the perspective of the black woman, you know, and we said, look, this is this has got to be a triple exploitation. You know, she's exploited as a woman, she's exploited as a worker, and she's exploited as a black woman. You know, and so that's the way we reconcile this whole notion of racial capitalism. You know, the thing that I think is really critical here, my when people ask me, what is US capitalism? How would I describe it? I would say that it is a class society whose DNA is white supremacy. And you know, when, when we begin to examine that definition, the DNA, I look back at the history. It, Wendy was very, very on point in the history of capitalism in the US. The thing that I want to point out is that, you know, capitalism in the US was founded not only on the basis of genocide and, and slavery, but it was also founded around this whole notion of private property. You know, and the, one of the things that I, I really learned from, from uh, David in, in our work with Move to Amend is that, you know, this was all enshrined in the constitution. 
The Constitution is not a human rights document. It is a property document, you know, and more is a private property document, you know, and I distinguish private property from personal property. You know, my, my car, my, my house, that's personal property. Private property is that property that is exploiting others to make a profit for the owner of that property. And when you think about uh, slavery in the US, and you think about the establishment of that constitution, you know, how do you have a constitution that on the one hand says that every quote unquote man is, is equal, but at the same time, since, since uh, descendants of Africans were slaves and property, they're no longer human. They're not men. They're somewhere else. They're property. What that says to me is that white society white supremacy was enshrined in the Constitution from the very beginning. And if it's enshrined in the Constitution, then, it, then you can understand why in every institution that capitalism has established, white supremacy is enshrined in that institution. You can't name me one institution that it's not, you know, and we can test that if you want to later. But I think that's really critical that when you look at the relationship between white supremacy and capitalism, you have got to conclude that, that you cannot end capitalism, you cannot end white supremacy in a capitalist society without ending capitalism. You know, and because it is so in, you know, enshrined in every institution. So the concepts of private property and white supremacy is intertwined, you know, and so you can't you can't get around uh, looking at those concepts together. So I don't look at the question of race and and white supremacy and the question of class as being opposites of each other. They're intertwined. I mean, I don't see how we can deal with the concepts of white supremacy in U.S. capitalism and not deal with the concept of class, you know, because, you know, one of the ways that we're looking at white supremacy today is this whole question of policing and whether or not we should have, you know, and we do have an abolitionist movement and we think that the only solution to the policing here is abolition. And if you gotta, you gotta get rid of the police and the military, you know, how is U.S. capitalism gonna survive that? You know, and not only is that disruptive, as Thurin was talking about, that can lead to the overthrow of capitalism. So, so I really think that those two concepts, the concept of private property and the institutionalization of white supremacy in the entire, uh, you know, country, in the entire civil society of the U.S. can only do one thing. And I'll conclude with that, that our only, only way that we can rid ourselves of oppression and exploitation, you know, capitalism, white supremacy. The only way we can do that is to get rid of capitalism and move on to a cooperative society that takes, that values human life as the number one thing and not private property. Thank you. So y'all can see why I was so much looking forward to, to this conversation. Uh, it was all I could do not to jump, jump in to the conversation, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to invite our panelists to just have a dialogue together. They're all skilled organizers. Uh, so Ethaban, I know that you had something that you wanted to share, and I'm going to encourage the four of y'all to, to, to just riff together and let the rest of us watch. I'll, I'll jump in from time to time if there's something in the chat, but this is really y'all's conversation. Yeah, thank you. Um, diving into the conversation, just to lift up one piece that I think is so helpful from what you just framed up, Jerome, um, which is, and it's something that I hear from one of my colleagues, um, uh, Autumn Brown with uh, with Aorta, and she, you know, she does a lot of work around whiteness, and we have this new whiteness institute that we're rolling out, building political analysis around it, um, which is that we can't get to uh, you know the full embodied post-capitalist racial solidarity, um, let alone just like attacking uh, white supremacy without 
helping um, everybody divorce in their minds the idea of white people from the idea of whiteness. Like that's part of what the project was of white supremacy was to conflate those in the first place. So that's part of why political education is really important, all the different forms of organizing that we do um, and, and why we need to insist on multiracial organizing um, because even the act of organizing in multiracial spaces is a, is a bit of a like, fuck you to racial capitalism by, by insisting that white people are part of this. And, and it's because we're, when white people um, divest from the project of whiteness, uh, right? Then, then we're in movement together because whiteness is the part that we're attacking here, not white people right? And helping people grapple with that difference. It's not like, oh, this is part of who white people and whiteness and I have this privilege and how do I, uh, uh. it's like, no, actually understand, do some rigorous analysis, understand that we're not talking about you as a white person. We're talking about whiteness as a regime of private property, uh, which is literally what whiteness is. I mean, when the laws <laughs> were written, so just to bring it home to, to brother Jerome here, when the laws were written in this country, that's what whiteness was. It had nothing to do with the paper bag test on your skin or anything else. It literally was, are you a property owning class? It was a descriptor of the owning class <laughs> under racial capitalism in the United States um, and in Britain and blah, 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 around the world, right? That, that whole regime got globalized. So understanding that is so essential to what it looked like, because then it starts to make sense. What was this bargain that was made to say, mm, can we include uh, Southern uh, Europeans into the project of whiteness? Like, what is that bargain to say Italians are now white? Or here are the privileges that we will now extend to you if you agree to, to, uh, to adopt the mantle of whiteness. We're not just saying, um, okay, anyone from Europe is now white. We're, we're literally saying you now need to take on this role of being a class um, traitor <laughs> to what is in your interest as part of the non-ruling class. So just wanted to lift that up. Um, I appreciate that so much. Well, sorry, go. One question I have, and it's a particularly thorny one, is the, the relation of white people to whiteness. Th that is not uniform across history, and it's begun to change. And, and I, f I think that much of the current moment, especially the rise of uh, fascist movements, is to be explained by the fact that the value of whiteness is no longer what it once was. And um, do we have theories that allow us to capture this changing value of whiteness or the changing appeal to whiteness as a form of solidarity with the ruling class from the white working class or parts of the white working class? So I know I am the facilitator, but uh, as a uh, white skinned uh, person who comes out uh, of poverty, I, I feel like I, I, I am almost obliged uh, to point out something and, and build up on what Esteban uh, pointed out. Like, like even before the rise of fascism, let's be perfectly clear, as somebody with my pigment who absolutely receives privileges uh, in this racialized society, even with all the privileges I get, I will argue and I argue to my, uh, my other rural, uh, quote, uh, non-formally educated cousins, it's a bad fucking deal. Like yeah. the cost of what it actually, to get those privileges, what it actually cost me is my humanity. It actually cost me uh, an incredible amount of, 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 of uh, ignoring or rejecting or pretending as if it wasn't real, a history that is blood on the roots and blood on the leaves. It actually is costing me at a personal, philosophical, spiritual, psychic cost that we have to pretend every day as if it's not actually true. And I'm gonna tell y'all, like, like, so that alone, and I have to give credit to people like Jerome Scott and Saren Mudliar and so many, uh, and Serena Harmon and so many people in my background who were non-white, who helped me to actually, to because 
like I'm of this society, right? Like growing up in poverty doesn't mean that I didn't get white skin privilege. I got it. I didn't know it though. See, that's the thing. They fuck with you. They, they like the, the ruling elite, they know what they are doing, right? All I'm getting at here, y'all, is that even before the rise of fascism, it was a bad deal. And now with the rise of fascism, like it is becoming explicit and clear. Jerome, you've heard me say it. I used to say all the time, I only have one enemy and that's my class enemy. And now I'm having to come to this realization. Actually, I have two broad enemies. I have my class enemy and I have members of my own class and Esteban, you, you made this point. Uh, I, I also have people who are in my class who are making the decision to side with the fascists instead of the class. Because I actually believe that we're either at, at this moment, historically, where we're either going to unite and fight as a class against the owning ruling class and win, or we're going to, yeah, that's it. That's, yeah. So that's how yeah. I would answer that question. Yeah, I would like to add one thing to that. You know, I, I live in the South. And um, if you, the, the history of this country will tell you that the Southern region is the poorest region. It's been the poorest region historically ever since uh, the Civil War, the, you know, and, and the defeat. You know, before the Civil War, it was the richest part of the country. You know, it was the most wealthy because it owned slaves. Uh, but the fact is that since the end of the Civil War and the defeat of Reconstruction, the wages in the South have been held down to a sub minimum ever since. And how is that possible? It is possible because Black labor in the South after the Civil War was at near zero. Sharecropping and the systems that were set up after the Civil War meant that that wages in the South were so low that it held down not only the wages of white workers throughout the South, but it held down the wages of workers throughout the country. You know, and so you look at white privilege, that's one side of the problem. But the fact that you support white privilege means that white workers also suffer because their wages are tied to the wages of black workers. You know, and so, so yeah, I mean, it's a two-edged edge sword and I think we should appreciate that. Well, and if it wasn't an incredibly valuable slice of the world, they wouldn't they wouldn't have chased millions of black people off right. of that land. They wouldn't right. have chased indigenous people off of that oh, land. Yeah. So like yeah. let's be real. Yep. Uh, I will actually jump in then because Wendy, uh, like you all said just nuggets, but I'm wondering if you could say uh, or, or build a little bit uh, on race as an alibi for plunder. And, and let's, let's delve into that, this idea that race was not actually, was an alibi for it, but it wasn't racial animus to begin with. Like it, you know, to, me, to me, it's like, it's not personal. So race as an alibi. Can you talk a little more about that? Yeah, you know, Walter Rodney talked about how um, the, um, you know, seizure and of African land and African people wasn't about racism. It was about economics. It was about building capitalism. Um, and so race becomes, race takes on a life of its own then and becomes uh, an alibi for all, all, all kinds of things that happen. There's something wrong with us, our culture, our biology is pathological and white folks know how to do it better. So we get ground down. So I think, I think that's, um, well, I don't remember when I realized that, but it's, it's an important way to look at it because it's an excuse, right? There's no fundamental reality to any of it except as a way to build great wealth and keep people. I wanna, I wanna I'm interested in, in what, y'all think by connecting it back to um, just the example of South Africa, where, um, you know, if, if a certain cohort of elite liberals in this country were to be believed, 
we would achieve liberation simply by liberating black people from the chains of white supremacy. And yet you look at what that project was <laughs> to your framing remarks, um, sir, and what, what that project was in South Africa. And it's like, cool, you can, you can even in a country that is super majority black, you still have a white minority <laughs> that is controlling capital. Like the ruling elite is still white. Um, uh, if you, in yeah. And so it, it reframes what the project is in some ways when, when we can look to, see, this is why that, that ain't it. Like this is why some of these um, struggles do need to be reframed about what, yeah, what you're saying about like who is our target or our enemy. Um, and how do we get down to some real stuff? It doesn't mean that we don't need to like undo and challenge and confront white supremacy, but you can't delink that from the project of, um, of capital itself um, and of wealth building and ownership and control. That is what's driving not only the market and the economy and how we're taking care of people's needs, but literally the state. That's what's, that's what's controlling state power um, and the kind of investments and risks that we take even at a loss, even at the expense of, um, of, of profit maximizing things. It's not always just about maximizing profit, that sometimes the logic of white supremacy will drive everyone right off the cliff for the sake of, you think these state run prisons are profitable? They're not profitable. <laughs> They'll fund it through tax dollars. They don't care. They're not doing it off of, for the sake of like making a buck. They're doing it out of a whole other logic that's tied to racial capitalism. And can I say that I, I worry um, about the socialist project and the socialist struggle in the US because I worry about the education of white people and how people understand how people understand what's going on. Um, there's a great deal of class reductionism and a confusion about what constitutes class rolling around in the United States. And I want to cite the example. I'm not throwing shade too terribly much, but DSA just produced a movie called The, the S Word about socialism in which I learned socialism is, a, is as American as apple pie. Well, the pie is fucking poisoned. So why would we want socialism like that? So, so I think there's just a tremendous amount of confusion and the confusion is with white people are the ones that are confused both about the pixie dust of white supremacy that was you know, blown into your noses and eyes and, and um, everything else. Um, yeah, I really, I really want to pick up on that because to me, one of the most important things that we could do as revolutionaries, as progressives, if that's what you think you are, uh, is, is political education. You know, I mean, and I don't mean just political education of white folks. There's a lot of black folks need political education. We don't, we don't mean that. Uh, but political education is critical because the miseducation that goes on in this society is all pointed toward one thing, and that is divide and conquer. You know, if they can, if they can make you believe, well, first of all, they made us believe that race, different races actually exist. You know, like, it's not just the human race, it's just, you know, you got all these races, and if you have all these different races, then one of them have to be superior to the others. And that happens to be white. The white race is superior. Well, if we start with that lie, and are we convinced that that's true, then all these subsequent lies can be generated as well. You know, and so we need to educate ourselves and educate the people around us on a day-to-day -day basis. Because if we're really going to build up enough strength that critical mass of people that can actually threaten the, you know, the stability of U.S. capitalism, it's going to have to be a multiracial force that is educated about the history and the direction of this country now so that we know exactly where to strike our blows so that we don't waste blows in the process. Now, if I were to respond to the point that Jerome is making, uh, which I agree with, and and the point that Wendy made about um, DSA, uh, not so much DSA, but uh, a sector within DSA producing the S word. Um, the, I, I'd like to take some lessons from the South African revolutionary process, right? 
um, in 1990 with the with the release of Nelson Mandela, South Africa was really at a revolutionary moment. People saw a very short distance from the mobilizations of the 1980s to some sort of socialist breakthrough. Of course, that was not to be. Over the next four years leading up to the first non-racial elections, there was a progressive demobilization of the left and uh, literally what was called black on black violence was carried out on the most revolutionary communities in order to prevent them from demanding or diminishing their capacity to hold their own organization, the African National Congress, accountable. So there's this profound demobilization of the grassroots in order to carry out a, a project of de-socializing the revolutionary process may, in terms of producing a so-called non-racial capitalism, right? So today we have a white ruling class, but a multiracial governing class in South Africa, uh, one that is capable of keeping um, uh, sort of the wraps on any revolutionary impulses for unfortunately the foreseeable future. Similarly, I think in the United States, we see that with every election wave, there is a mobilization of the grassroots, a massive, powerful mobilization of the grassroots. And then uh, structurally, they've demobilized right after the elections. So for the rotation of elites to occur that just occurred back in November and then was threatened in January, for that rotation of elites to occur, you do need a mobilization of the base. And I think that and this is uh, sort of partially in response to Wendy's comment about DSA, which, which I decided to join almost on a whim about um, a year ago, um, and, I, and I'm committed to, is that um, I think that there are organizations like DSA that need to be engaged with uh, uh, our approaches that combine race and class. Uh, in order that we may build that revolutionary subject, that subject that routinely gets demobilized. I think that with organizations like DSA, we have a unique problem in our recent history. We have an organization with nearly 100,000 members across the country, many of them white, but also significant numbers of younger people of color, unconnected to either the reformist anti-revolutionary DSA past, un unconnected to the Cold War past of DSA, and who are also unconnected from the legacies of the Black Liberation Movement. And I think our duty is to rebuild and create those connections now with these young people who make up the majority of the 85 to 100,000 members that, that make up DSA. I'll pass at that. I, can I just say, I'm, I'm sorry to throw shade at DSA. I am myself marginally a DSA member, um, uh, but don't have um, the field. Yeah, I can't get into it, but, um, but so I, I don't, I'm not, th I'm throwing shade at the film. How about that? Yeah, Wendy, uh, I'll just say it this way. Like, so I'm a Green Party member. And I have a scathing critique of the Green Party structurally. So, so like I heard you at, engaged in constructive critique. Uh, and so I'm a revolutionary first. I do think that we have to have an electoral arm to this movement, uh, authentically engaging in electoral politics. But actually, I just really wanna say, I didn't hear you throwing shade. I heard you engaging in proper constructive critique. And if this movement is gonna take itself seriously, We've got to engage in critique and self-critique so that we can actually have these conversations. Because this fragility, it ain't just white fragility. It ain't just male fragility. Like, come on, y'all. Like, we got fucking work to do. Like, we've got to actually be willing to grapple with this. So I just want to say I didn't hear shade. I think that last piece is ultimately the most important thing. I mean, out of the entire conversation is that we have work to do, right? So... Tell me who's on the fringes, who's exploring the horizon, who's the vanguard of eh, eh, eh theory. I don't actually care at a certain point. It doesn't matter. I want to see people organizing. I want to see people being organized. And I want to see them grappling with their conditions in that context. You have people who are organized. You can do political education. You can do mobilization. You can grapple with like, what are the targets that we're choosing? What's our strategy? What are coalitions we're moving through? But we're living in an age where people are not organized. So I, I actually, at a certain point, I don't care what formation they're organized under. 
get people organized and then we can work with that right like let's actually engage um with uh with with formations um of organizing and i think that that that's the part of praxis that gets the that gets under uh weighted um in in a lot of conversations you know um and, and thinking about our strategy that there is a lot of analysis um, in most places, and I think everyone here is saying the same thing, in most places, there's not enough analysis. But in the places where it's there, it's like we are so deep into like, oh, yeah, I'm seizing upon this Hegelian thing and this other dialectic. And like at a certain point, go talk to some people and see how confused the class politics are in the United States. Talk to your neighbors and see that they're like, no, 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 like I do, th I think I support Medicare for all, but I also think that like, Black people are like getting, to, being too loud and taking up too much space. And like, I also think like people are all over the place and that's the project is ha helping to engage with them and move them, right? And I think that especially um, the thing that I'm wary, it's not that I'm wary about, the thing where I'm eager to see some strategy develop is around this presumed alliance among the sort of progressively liberally we were even starting to talk about that here we're like oh yeah nancy pelosi is like kneeling in a kente cloth like maybe she's just like one electoral cycle away from being like in the movement and it's like y'all we have so much more in common with a bunch of like trump voters who have not been uh, organized, who don't have a political analysis, but, or sorry, they don't have what we would recognize as a sort of orthodox political analysis, but part of their support of 45 has a lot to do with them grappling with alienation and a lot of other stuff that they're pinning on the Clintons and the, the neoliberal, I mean, that has everything to do with racial capitalism, even if the guy was a grifter and you know has exploited that in a lot of ways. So like, what would that look like to do that level of organizing and mobilizing so that they're not so easily picked off by the Josh Hollies and the Ted Cruz's of the world? That shouldn't be happening, right? And here we are debating like DSA versus like the communist left versus the tankies. And it's like, at a certain point, can we just get out of the ivory tower for a second and like start to build with people, right? And I think that when we slow down to do that, a lot of stuff gets revealed. And it turns out that Nancy Pelosi ain't your friend and we all know it, <laughs> um, right? So then what are the deals that we're striking in order to get some of our things through in order to mainstream them? I think it's incredible to see how dramatically the Overton window has shifted toward the kind of multiracial class politics and socialist projects that we're talking about. Um, whether that's like decriminalization of you name the thing, right? Like marijuana all the way down, whether that's around defunding the police, whether that's around um, just a critique of policing in and of itself or of the carceral um, state and uh, industrial complex. Um, some of the universal basic income stuff. I mean, there is UBI for children in the United States, at least for the next nine months. Where did that come from? That came from stuff that pick your variety of the left. Right. Some of those were DSA people. Some of those were Bernie people. Some of the right. But like it's happening. Right. And so I'm interested in effective organizing. And at a certain point, I don't care what your name tag is or what your affiliation is or which books you read. I care what you're doing in the streets, the conversations, the streets or which conversations you're having um, in your communities. Yeah, I certainly agree with that. Um, you know, taking the long view. Uh, for me, I'm, I mean, like I said before, I'm, I'm 75 years old, so I've been around a little while. And um, when I think about organizing, when I look at the last 10 years, the organizing of the last 10 years have stepped up every year. Every year, there's more and more organizing going on. But more importantly than just organizing, there is organizing going on among uh, working class white folks, you know, which I think is really critical when you think about the, this whole motion toward fascism. I mean, it's critical that we understand that there needs to be some work among white workers, and some of that work is going on. One of the organizations that I've been sort of hanging with is called um, uh, Rednecks for Black Lives, you know, which is a group of rural organizers around the South you know, that, is, that did a lot of work in the last electoral cycle uh, 
and is doing a lot of work, continual work in the, in the rural areas of the South. But more importantly, they're also engaging in political education. They're really trying to understand uh, that this whole concept of white allies, you know, is a concept that we should throw out the door. You know, we, I'm not looking for an ally. I'm looking for a comrade. I'm, I'm looking for someone that understands that they have as much stake in this battle as I do, because they do. You know, capitalism is working exactly the way it was planned to work. It is not working for working class people, no matter what you are, whether you're black, white, or, or some other thing. It's not working for us. You know, it's it, the exploitation that is mounting is increasing every day. So organizing is going on. And what, what I think we have, we have to continue to expand our organizing. You know, we don't have enough. We don't have that critical mass yet. But I just want to emphasize that we have to integrate political education into every step of organizing. And I just think that's critical because we got, we got a lot of stuff to overcome. And not the kind of political education that draws the fine line between Hegelian this and yeah. Kantian that, but the I kind swear. that actually asks us who's in charge, who's actually making decisions, and why. Honestly, y'all, this level of political education that's happening right here with a couple of changes in the language, I ain't joking, y'all. I could take this into a pool hall or a bowling alley and have this, this depth yeah. of the conversation. I might take some of the academia out a little bit, but honestly, this is the political education I'm interested in. And I, I, there's been a rich conversation for those of you who are, uh, who are watching us uh, on the recording. So I do want to pick up something that I want to lift up. Joe Ramsey uh, wrote in because there's a lot of good stuff here. But I want to really ask this question of our panelists. How do we work to prevent racial capitalism from being watered down and co-opted by the liberals and the pro-capitalist elements that are seeking to instru instrumentalize radical comments uh, through us off to throw us off the scent of their complicity complicity in both imperialism and exploitation. And I'll uh, engage. I'll invite each of you to uh, as the panelists to just re react and reflect to that question. Can I say something, even though it might be potentially throwing more shade? Um, I would like to say that I am very, very crit critical um, of the nonprofit industrial social justice complex. And I think that we need to have some conversations about that when we're talking about who's organizing and why. Um, there is um, a whole layer of people whose status and income is derived from their salary and their social justice organization. And um, those people are funded by the ruling class. So I, um, I think that's a really important thing to look at who's doing the organizing and why, you know, how much, how much, you know, nonprofit social justice organizations are not democratic, staff are not democratically elected. So I, I, I just wanna say that I, I wanna raise that when we're talking about organizing and um, how to not water down concepts of racial capitalism. To be in conversation about that, this is one of my favorite things to harp on when I'm in <laughs> groups who haven't heard me rant about it before, which is that, um, again, we got to like decenter the United States and all this because like we're last and figuring a lot of shit out. So my homies, my internationalist homies who, uh, who, who think about this question about organizing, philanthropy ain't what it is anywhere else in the world like it is here which by the way, has everything to do with racial capitalism. So let's just connect those dots between what Wendy just said and what we said in the first half hour of this panel, right? Like that is not an accident or like, a, oh, that's interesting coincidence, um, which is movement folks, you go to um, South America, you go to um, Southern Europe, movement folks who are engaged in, the, in building out, expanding democracy and the social solidarity economy, they don't just get their salaries from nonprofits. Some of them do, but the proportion is very different than in the United States. What, what options are we building up for, other, for people to make a living and be in movement? You can be in academia, that shit's under attack. 
You can be um, in nonprofits, which is like it takes up all the space. You can be in uh, unions or do labor organizing, and that, <laughs> right, has been shrinking, right? Uh, or you can do some uh, public service sector job, you know, a librarian, uh, school teacher, right? And so, like, these are our options. This is, you know, now there's a little bit of like, oh, yeah, and now you can maybe get a job starting a worker co op or being somehow involved in the social solidarity economy those ratios are all flipped and scrambled. You go to Spain, movement folk are like, I drive a taxi and I'm in the movement and my taxi is part of a worker owned cooperative where I am part of, right? So if we're, yeah, we can talk a lot about like, what is the ultimate vision? What does it even look like to expand, diversify the options of movement folk to be uh, making their living underneath the racial capitalist regime without necessarily being like, oh, which problematic nonprofit do you want to be messing with, right? Like there need to be more options for people to be the radical teachers, the radical library, without it constantly being on the front lines of like, we're defunding this library, we're shutting it down, we're defunding these schools and turning them into prisons, like all of that stuff. That's why I do the work I do, right? Which is around, I'm not taking responsibility for building out every front of this, but certainly we are nowhere near where we could be in cooperativizing and expanding the social solidarity economy in so many sectors of our economy um, that then create spaces for people to be, to not have to be like a little bit productive in their day job and then clock in for their other shift for the movement, but to actually be expanding um, the horizon in all the work that they do, whether that's the reproductive labor, um, shout out to all the parents, caregivers, people who do, um, uh, who help to reproduce ourselves um, in, in the movement and as revolutionaries and for youth and children, right, all of that. Um, but like, let's grow the opportunities to do that. People who are doing uh, farming and agriculture and you know all these other uh, components. So I, I want to see more conversation there. Um, and it's nice to see some of our homies who are deeply involved in advancing that horizon um, and building out economic democracy here in the Zoom. You know, I'd like to take up Joe's question by, by starting in the same places that Esteban and, and Wendy did, by looking at the organizational framework in which um, any kind of cooptation could happen. And I, and I agree that um, especially what we're calling the nonprofit industrial complex is one of those places that takes the most radical ideas, domesticates them and accommodates them to capitalism. I would also want to bend the stick in the other direction and, th and think about the fact that as the 1960s wave of revolutionary ideas and thinking receded, you had Marxists going into the academy, you had them also going into forming political party projects, right? The, the new communist movement came out of that, that particular choice. They also went into trade unions where they either lived underground or they changed their politics and they went into social movements. And when they went into social movements, may, many of those simply became expressions of the nonprofit industrial complex, others did not. But we had four distinct areas of political practice and knowledge creation. And, you know, we, we see the outcomes in things like ethnic and gender studies within the academy, the outcomes of social movements going into the academy, right? And that has had both positive and not so positive uh, outcomes for it. But I think that where we're right now is we need to find a way to, to gather together the different knowledges created in the social movements, including in the nonprofit world, where there are distinct forms of knowledge created within those people who went into the trade union movement, as well as those who sort of survived the, the new communist movement era and create uh, and adapted their politics to new to new moments. So I think that there's a lot of political practice out there where the concept of racial capitalism was interesting to them in different ways. And right now there's a theoretical task, right? That is different from a popular education task, a theoretical task of integrating the different knowledges created in these different sites of struggle. And so I'm hoping that, you know, to the extent that we pull out of that a praxis around racial capitalism with the hyphen that Esteban implored us to adopt, 
at that moment, we, we will have deeper knowledge that can inform our political practice, the decade of ever increasing political activism that Jerome spoke to. So that's my request. So the time has flown by and this, like as promised, this conversation has been deep, it's been thoughtful and it's been provocative. Uh, want to make sure to remind folks that we intentionally scheduled this back to back so that uh, nobody uh, would have to choose between this session or the session that Emily Kawano is going to be reading on the framework of the Solidarity Economy for Resist and Build. So at uh, that session is going to start in at, at, right at the uh, 30 minute mark. Remember, for those of you who have been with us, you already know, close out here, go to that next session on that platform. Uh, so I'm going to solicit final thoughts in reverse order. Uh, that means, Jerome, your final thoughts. Yeah, thank you. First of all, um, I just want to express how I really appreciate the other panelists and, and the, the facilitation of this session. I think it has been very, very good. Um, I guess two things I wanted to say in closing. One about the, um, the you know, nonprofit community. It was interesting in my life, you know, I, I, I started organizing in the factories and the auto factories in Detroit. And of course, you know, there was no such thing as a proposal for a grant. I, you know, never, I never even heard that concept in my organizing work in Detroit at all. You know, I get fired from the plants. I end up in the South. I try to do some organizing here. And the first thing I hear when I try to organize in the South was, hey, man, you got to get you a grant. And I go, what, wait a minute. What do I need a grant for? I'm, I'm trying to get people to organize and own our organization. And if you get money from someone else, then you don't totally own that organization. You know, you'd be holding to somebody else. But that was my introduction to this whole nonprofit thing. And I think, what I think is important is that you know that the ruling class is not giving out money for nothing. They don't, they don't do that. They're giving out money to the nonprofit uh, community because they want to control what that nonprofit community do. That's why the laws around the nonprofit uh, industrial complex, as I call it, prevents you from you know, doing certain things that is the most advantageous sometimes to your organizing. You know, so take that point and go back to my essential point that I want to end with here. Political education, if you, you can do nonprofit work, you have to know what you're into. You have to know where that money's coming from and what it's trying to do to you. But you also have to educate everyone around you about that. You know, and you got to know that if you want to keep doing, getting that money, you're not going to propose or do things that is disruptive to the capitalist system. They will cut you off in a moment. <clears throat> if you are dedicated to disrupting capitalism, then you have to be able to uh, you know, be self-funded through various processes. And we can figure it out. I mean, there's enough people that want to want um, the revolutionary process in this country to continue and widen, and we'll pay for it, you know, but we're not going to pay for it if you're not going to do the work. So political education, I think, is critical, even when you're doing work in the nonprofit area. But the other point I wanted to make about political education is that somehow, and I've been, you know, struggling with this, we, we have got to teach theory as well, and we have got to be able to teach theory in a way that people can accept it and understand it. You know, we might have to change the language a little bit, but we have to teach theory because if people don't understand that capitalism, no matter what you do to it, no matter how we try to correct it, it is not broken. Working the way it's supposed to work. Capitalism is an exploitive and oppressive society that we can't do anything about except get rid of. We can mitigate it along the way, but if we don't get rid of it, these problems are going to continue and grow. And, you know, this problem of fascism 
is really a critical one that we need to discuss, not in this session, of course. But you know, that's their only reprieve. If they can't run this thing through bourgeois democracy, which is what we're yep. experiencing now, then they're going to establish outright dictatorship and fascism, you know? And so uh, we got a lot of work to do, like David said earlier, and, you know, let's do it. I think people wouldn't have believed really? you until three months ago, and now everyone's like, yep, that literally is true. Um, I will close by saying that, you know, sometimes the prospect of grappling, grappling with racial capitalism or with capitalism or with racism and white supremacy. It's like, oh, that's so overwhelming. How could I possibly? And yet I want people to leave with the motivation knowing that like we're winning, things are changing. There's a lot of opportunities and it's, it's, it doesn't come from starting with this big theoretical overwhelming impossible system, but like there's an opening right now. <laughs> um, after 23 years of building more and more and more prisons in California, year after year after year, they have not built any more prisons. That came from organizing. That came from people coming together and being like, oh, from abolitionists coming together and being like, wait a minute, no, right? Some of that was electoral pressure. Some of that was, right, where it comes from. It, that, that's different than grappling with how could I possibly intervene with racial capitalism? There's never been, well, not never, in the last... 30 plus years, almost 40 years, there hasn't been as much popular support for unions, including in quote unquote red states and like right to work states and purple states as there is today, right? Led by teachers unions, led by nurses unions, yes. But like, just get out of the whole team colors thing of like team red, team blue, like that's not what's happening. There's an opportunity to organize those people, right? Like they're down, they're totally down. And lastly, if the shutting down prisons isn't your thing, if the organizing unions isn't your thing, you can get involved in social solidarity economy projects right now. There's so many ways to, um, to dig into that. Land trust things, um, worker-owned co-op farms, um, other food system interventions, um, businesses, right? Like that's part of what I did. I could have done the stuff Aorta does by applying for grants. We started a business instead make markets work, right? You can be an anti-capitalist business. I don't know when that memo kind of slipped my whole generation, but at a certain point we got hip to it and we were like, oh wait, we don't just need to like reject productive. Like we, this means that we have nothing to do with the nonprofit industrial or very little to do with the nonprofit industrial complex. And similarly, the worker co-op federation could have been a nonprofit. We're not a C3 nonprofit. We're a C6. How many C6 organizations do you know of in your life? We are a chamber of commerce, y'all. You pay dues, you write them off off your damn taxes <laughs> and we marshal all of the the sort of the clout of the all the businesses in our membership when we go and talk to city council members or other unions right so there's a lot of different ways to organize and and it doesn't take it doesn't take a big systemic change to get started right now with that it contributes to that systemic change over time am i next yeah you yeah. are Okay, so I just want to end by having a little reflection on um, Sankofa and on how we know what we're doing. And I want to say that one of the most brutal aspects of racial capitalism is the demotion and destruction of forms of knowledges um, that have been of the people that have been in the way of global capital's expansion. And so I want to remind people that, and I think, I mean, in some ways, solidarity economy exemplifies that um, in some ways, um, but I want to just raise that to say that um, how we know what we're doing and how we know what we want needs to be informed. We need to be able to look beyond and before capitalism, um, colonialism, um, in order to figure out what we want, what we want our worlds to look like. Sarah, bring us home. I find it next to impossible to beat the point that, that Wendy made, and I don't think it needs to be beaten. Where, where, does, where are the sources of knowledge and values for the system we wish to create? And this means looking back at those movements, at racial capitalism, capitalism have, uh, have ground down and attempted to defeat, and yet they survive. They, they survive in the form of the... Um, 
solidarity economy that Esteban is talking about, the surviving those waves of self-conscious engagement with the nonprofit industrial complex in order to make change that Jerome is talking about. So it's with all of these different movements and with these agendas that Wendy has provided us with, the organizational forms that Esteban has provided us with, that I look forward to the next sessions and how this conference follows up for all of us going into the future. Thank you for bringing us all together and I really appreciated Jerome's, Wendy's and Esteban's comments. Thank you. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to Nicola for running the tech for us. Thank you for coming to this session. Please join me as we welcome Emily Kawano, talk about the resist and build framework. Really, I believe building on what this conversation has been, reminder, close this session, go back to the site. You have to open the next Zoom link. See you over there. Bye, y'all.